Good afternoon and uh, welcome to this event marking the publication of the book Learning the Lessons of Modern War. Uh, I am Eric Edelman. I am a practitioner in residence here at um, Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and I'm delighted to welcome our two guests today, Dr. Tom Mankin and uh, General H.R. McMaster um, to uh, discuss this, uh, this book. Um, let me start by introducing uh, both of them. Uh, Tom Mankin is the senior research professor here at Johns Hopkins uh, SICE. He has a bachelor's degree from the University of Southern California and an MA and PhD at, uh, from SICE, so he is definitely a homegrown product. He's also the president of the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, and I had the pleasure of working with him when I was Under Secretary of Defense, when he was my Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Policy Planning. He's been a Naval Reservist for 24 years uh, and the author uh, and editor of uh, too many books for me to be able to fit into this uh, one hour um, uh, broadcast um, and is the editor of Learning the Lessons of um, uh, uh, Modern War. H.R. Uh, McMaster, our other guest, I have to say I first met uh, 15 years ago when I was undersecretary. I traveled to El Kissick in Iraq where uh, I was told a young army colonel had been doing some extremely uh, innovative things uh, to uh, wage counterinsurgency warfare uh, in Talafar in, um, in Iraq. And I went out to El Kissick to meet uh, H.R. I already knew of him from his academic work. Um, he's a native of Philadelphia, a U.S. Uh, military academy graduate with an M.A. and a Ph.D. from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where his doctoral dissertation became the uh, very well-known book, Dereliction of Duty, about civil military relations in wartime. Uh, this book had its origins uh, when he was the deputy commanding uh, general of uh, TRADOC, uh, the uh, Training and Doctrine Command of the U.S. Army, and the director of the Army Capabilities Integration Center. Um, uh, Jack Keene, who is a colleague of mine and a board member at CSBA, where Tom and I occasionally hang our hats, uh, described uh, General McMaster as an extraordinary general officer, a thought leader and innovator, uh, who also demonstrated sheer brilliance uh, as a uh, brigade, um, wartime brigade commander. And uh, HR is also, uh, of course, former national security ad uh, advisor to President Trump and has written his own book, Battlegrounds, which I hope he'll touch on during the course of our discussion. But to get us kicked off, let me turn the floor over uh, to Tom Mankin, who will outline the um, origins of the book and uh, some of the themes of it before turning the floor over to HR. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Edelman. Uh, and a particular thanks to, uh, to General McMaster, uh, because as, uh, as Eric pointed out, I mean, without HR, this book wouldn't have uh, have come about. Um, this book grew out of a project uh, that he sponsored and and inspired, what two three jobs ago uh, when he was serving uh, as the commanding general of the Army Capabilities Integration Center, uh, which is meant to help the U.S. Army learn the lessons of contemporary wars. I'll say he had the uh, the great uh, uh, foresight in uh, uh, putting together this project to look at the lessons of contemporary wars, and it's it's been my pleasure to. Uh, uh, to be associated with that project from, from the beginning. That project included a, a, a conference uh, in October of 2015 at Johns Hopkins Applied F uh, Physics Laboratory that brought together a, a world-class group of scholars. And this book is the, the ultimate fruits of that, uh, of, of that project. So it's, it's particularly fitting that, uh, that we have uh, General McMaster with us uh, today to, to, talk about, uh, to talk about this topic. This book uh, tackles one of the central challenges of strategic studies, the difficulty of understanding the features of future wars. Um, if, you're, if you're a sort of a, a gloomy person like me, uh, the world is, uh, and history is divided up between war and interwar periods. Either you're at war or you're in an interwar period of uncertain duration. And, and thus, you know, learning the lessons of, of past wars and contemporary wars really, really is crucial to, uh, to effectiveness. Because even if you're at war, it's a war in a particular place against a particular adversary. And it's questionable how much of that experience can or, or should translate into the future. 
I think it is really one of the, the things that sets the military profession apart from all other professions, which is the, the, uh, the, the scarcity and the, uh, the uncertainty surrounding professional evidence of, 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 uh, of the military profession. So this, this book really, uh, really focuses on that. The, uh, the first part of the book uh, discusses the importance and the challenges of learning the lessons of, of modern wars, learning lessons from military history. The uh, second section of the book explores the lessons uh, of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, two protracted irregular wars that have shaped a generation of American allied and coalition soldiers uh, individually and collectively. And I think we'll, we'll be, uh, we'll be living with the, the lessons and the legacy of those wars for decades to come. And the book's final section examines the lessons of other recent wars from across the globe. It's a good reminder that uh, you know, we should learn not only from our own experience, but from others' experience as well. And so for, for better or worse, the, the contemporary world offers a rich set of cases to inform soldiers and scholars alike as they seek to understand the character and conduct of contemporary war. And even uh, beyond the chapters that are, that are so ably uh, presented in this book, there's a whole host of other conflicts that we, that we could be studying and we should be studying to include the Russia's war in Ukraine, uh, the Syrian civil war, the war in Yemen, and of course the recent uh, uh, Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict. Uh, but as we look at contemporary wars as a whole, several themes really stand out. The first has to do with the value of history to the military profession. You know, at one level, the nature of war is unchanging. Hence, we can learn a lot from not just studying contemporary conflicts, but going all the way back to the, the Peloponnesian Wars. Um, but at another level, the character and, of, and conduct of war evolves as politics, society, and certainly technology change. And then yet at another level, each war is different, right? The result of unique political objectives and the interaction of belligerents, as well as friction, probability, and chance. I think one of the, the main challenges of trying to apply history to understand future war is differentiating the, the unchanging uh, from the, the, the changing and the changeable. A second theme uh, that emerges from this book has to do with the role of institutions in learning military lessons. Learning useful military lessons requires both the attention and the involvement of leaders, as well as flexible structures to internalize those lessons and learn from them. And here, I think you know, the US military has, has a, a variable track record over the years. Um, and there are other militaries out there. And I think of the, the Russian military and the Chinese militaries. Uh, as being just two examples, the Israeli uh, military, the IDF, really uh, as being another example of militaries that really go out of their way, that devote a lot of attention to studying warfare, uh, see it as, you know, as, as a, a, a topic uh, worthy of study, not only their own experience, but the experience of others. And I, I think there's, there are things that we can learn from that. A third lesson has to, or the, third theme rather, has to do with the perennial challenge of measurement in military affairs. Uh, we're human beings and we tend to be drawn to measurements. We tend to be drawn to quantification. And certainly metrics can be useful, uh, but only if they truly clarify rather than obscure what's happening on the ground and help soldiers and statesmen determine how military forces are doing in achieving their political objectives. I think there's a lot in the history of Iraq, Afghanistan, and the other uh, conflicts that we study that uh, shows good use of metrics and poor use of metrics. Fourth, uh, the cases discussed in this volume demonstrate that the process of identifying problems and developing solutions takes time. And I think that's a, that's a valuable thing for us to, to, to think about. Um, I think it's, it's true that in warfare, we're not apt to get everything right at the beginning. Again, it gets back to the, the challenge of the military profession, of, of just the, the scarcity of experience. We should harvest what experience we can and harvest the lessons we can, but we should also realize that we're likely to get some things wrong. Well, the question then is what military organizations can do to improve, to adapt under fire. And that's a, that's a process that's, that's, again, likely to take time. And we need to, we need to factor that, that in. 
you're, you're unlikely to get it right in the, in the first battle. Fifth, uh, the chapters in this book demonstrate the importance of understanding one's adversary, both as uh, a war unfolds and in retrospect. And I think it's, it's one of the, the features of, of military history, why oftentimes good military history takes uh, a long time to produce. It's because it's only after time that we get a good understanding of what was going on on the other side of the hill. I think, you know, the, uh, our understanding of the Vietnam War, for example, is improving as we get more uh, understanding, greater understanding of the dynamics of what was going on, not just in Saigon, but also in, in Hanoi during that war. And similarly, I think, our, uh, although our understanding of the Iraq War was helped immensely by uh, the capture of uh, the Iraqi Ba'ath archive in, in 2003 and subsequent efforts to, uh, by scholars to use those archives, it's only, I think, over time that we get a, a full understanding of the course of a war as we understand it from the, uh, from the adversary's perspective. A sixth and, and related theme uh, has to do with the importance and difficulty of understanding allies and partners, including host nation forces. It's not just about us, it's not just about our adversaries, but, but we need to understand uh, our allies as well. And, and uh, several of the chapters in, in this book I think do an extraordinary job of portraying Iraq and, and Afghanistan uh, from, from allied perspectives. Finally, to take things uh, full, full circle, the chapters in this book highlight both the unity and the diversity of modern wars. On the one hand, they, uh, they demonstrate the enduring value of classical concepts, including the need to match strategy to policy, the importance of assessment and reassessment, and the difficulty of terminating uh, a war successfully. At the same time, contemporary wars exhibit considerable diversity ranging from insurgency to high intensity operations fought on land, at sea, in the air, and in cyberspace by insurgents, militias, and states. And I think those, those trends uh, are, are, also, you know, are also present in other, other contemporary wars, and I would hazard to guess are, are likely to, uh, to endure into the future. So uh, I think we've, we've given in this book uh, grist for, for the mill for military professionals uh, of all stripes, those who wear the uniform and those who don't, uh, to really think about the, the, the lessons of contemporary wars and what they bode for us and for others. So I'll just leave it, uh, I'll leave it here and then turn it over to H.R. Uh, McMaster for, uh, for his comments. H.R.? Hey, Tom, thank you. It's, it's what a pleasure it is to be here with you and Eric, two people from whom I've learned so much over the years and Tom, I think the book came out great. I recommend it to everybody. Obviously, nothing, nothing says happy holidays like reading about you know, previous wars, re recent wars. But uh, I, I, I really benefited tremendously from the whole process of the, the work with you to understand what are the lessons and how to apply them to how we were thinking about future armed conflict. And as you know, the job that I had was to, to really to think clearly about future war and, and to lay a strong conceptual foundation for army modernization to learn, to learn in a continuous, sustained and focused manner, analyze what we learn so we develop solutions to our greatest capability gaps and, and make sure that our future forces uh, are able to, to maintain the competitive advantages in, into the future. Uh, and then obviously to implement those changes and, and build a more effective army and, and joint force. This project was very important to our efforts because I think it helped us understand that War, warfare, the character of warfare is subject to change, obviously, right? From changes in the geostrategic environment, changes certainly in technology. But when we get into trouble, I think, is when we neglect continuities, continuities in the nature of war. And I think this, many of the problems that we encountered in the wars of this century, I think were, were the result of bias in favor of change over continuity in the 1990s in, in particular, and in particular, the, the growth of this orthodoxy uh, associated with this idea of a revolution in military affairs uh, in, in, the, in the 1990s. And I, and I think this book helped really administer a corrective to that, to that kind of thinking, and I hope will convince us that as we look to preparing for future armed conflict that we ought to listen to the historian Carl Becker, who in an address before the American Historical Association in the 1930s, said continuity and change should walk hand in hand in a happy way without one 
uh, disputing or, or asserting primacy over the other. And so I thought what I'd do is just talk about how we neglected continuity in the nature of war in the 1990s and how that was a setup. I think it was a setup for the difficulties that we encountered, uh, especially in, in Afghanistan and Iraq, wars that were of unanticipated length and cost. I think, again, because of the neglect and continuities in, in the nature of war. And in the 1990s, th this orthodoxy of the revolution in military affairs resulted, I think, in four fallacies about future war. And then I'll talk it as a, in terms of the corrective, in terms of four continuities uh, in, in the nature of war that we have to keep foremost in mind as we now, again, try to make a grounded projection into the future and, and make sure our armed forces are prepared to deter and, if necessary, respond to and, 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 and prevail, respond to threats and, and prevail in, in, in armed conflict. The, fir the first of, of these fallacies we might call the vampire fallacy. Uh, <laughs> because you can't kill it. it. No matter what you do, it comes back, you know, about every 10 or, or 20 years. And this is really strategic bombing theory in a new guise every now and then. And in the 1990s, it was this belief that advances in new technologies, precision navigation and timing, surveillance technologies, communications uh, capabilities, precision strike complex overall, uh, as well as big data analytics, had shifted war fundamentally from the realm of uncertainty to the realm of certainty. So therefore, future wars would be waged quickly, cheaply, efficiently, and from standoff range. Remember the, the language of, of, of uh, concepts, defense concepts in the, in the 90s of you know, rapid, decisive operations. Well, that, that briefs really well. I mean, who could be against that, right? Are you for ponderous, indecisive operations? And then uh, you know, full spectrum dominance over any, everything was, you, know, you couldn't read a sentence in joint doctrine without the word dominant being in it. And of course, as you already mentioned in your, in, in your remarks at the beginning, hey, the reason why that doesn't work is because your enemy does have a future say in the future course of, of events and, and has accessible and available to, the, uh, to that enemy countermeasures that make these technological capabilities oftentimes only, only uh, of limited uh, use and, and, and advantage. The second you might call the zero dark 30 fallacy. And this is the idea that especially in connection with jihadist terrorists, we can just have a raiding capability or a drone strike capability. And of course, the problem with this is you can address really the symptoms of the problem of jihadist terrorism, but it doesn't really, it isn't adequate in, in connection with enduring security from those who want to commit mass murder against us. Um, and, and it doesn't get to the enduring defeat of, of these, these organizations. The third we might call the mutual of Omaha wild kingdom fallacy. And you know, this is going to take some explanation for younger generations, but back when Ambassador Edelman and I were young and, and uh, the world was virtuous and, and on television on Sunday nights, you would watch the wonderful world of, of Disney, right? How wholesome is that? Followed by the Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. And the draw of that show was, well, first of all, Marlon Perkins would introduce the topic of the day, you know, a lion, a, you know, a, a crocodile, a tiger, something like that. Uh, and, 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 but you know, Marlon wasn't going to put himself in danger. He had an assistant named Jim. And Jim would get down with the, the wildlife. And of course, the draw was, is Jim going to get munched on is what you wondered like during the show. But, but really, the idea here is that you don't have to be in the fight yourself. You'll just get other people to do the fighting for you. And so this is the idea that you can ex work exclusively through proxies in war and then, and then limit the costs that you might have to, to burden to shoulder yourself in terms of blood and, and also treasure. But of course, this neglects you know, what we would call principal agent problems and and the degree to which oftentimes your interests diverge from those of, of, of your of proxy forces and, and partner forces. And then finally, the RSVP fallacy, right? This is the idea that you, if you know, wars, that, that you, only you choose to go to war, that, that neglect that wars actually choose you sometimes, right? Thank you for your kind invitation to the war. The United States regrets it is unable to attend. And, and we should have learned that, obviously, on 9-11, on that wars do choose you. So the vampire fallacy, I think, is back back in a new guise and it's, it, it's, it's, it's impelled now by, by the artificial intelligence range of technologies, which really, really, really will make the next war fundamentally different from all those that have gone before it. Uh, the Zero Dark Thirty, uh, and, and, uh, I think uh, fallacy is alive and well. I look at just the withdrawal from Afghanistan and the belief that we can go back to the 1998 Bill Clinton counterterrorism strategy of firing you know, a few cruise missiles once in a while, you know, and calling it a day. Uh, the mutual of Omaha fa fallacy is, 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 is in force 
in this idea that we can work through proxies without any damage to the political aims that we're trying to achieve. Eastern Syria is, is maybe a case in point uh, there. So, so what do we do? I think the first thing that we do is, you know, we read, learning the lessons of, of, uh, <laughs> of modern war. And, uh, and, and what a great job you and, and the, co and, and the uh, contributors did. Uh, these are excellent essays. And I think what they do is when you read them, they help you strike a balance, a, ba a balance in understanding between continuity and change. They make Carl Becker happy, I think, uh, in, in that connection. And, and, uh, and, and what, what are the continuities that we have to keep in mind? Again, four of them, and I'll be very quick here because I, I'm anxious to get to the discussion. You know, war is an extension of politics. Okay, that's kind of like the Geico commercial, right? Everybody knows that. I mean, Bosworth said that. But what that means is that, that you have to, to wage war in a way that gets to that sustainable political outcome that's consistent with what brought you into the conflict to begin with. And it was the neglect of the need to consolidate gains to get to those sustainable outcomes that lengthened the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and made them more costly. Second is that the war is human. People fight for the same reasons Thucydides identified, right, 2,500 years ago. Fear, honor, and, and interest. And if you're, not, if you're not integrating the elements of your power and efforts of like-minded partners to address the drivers of that conflict, you are by definition only treating the symptoms. Third, war is uncertain. War is uncertain in the conduct of war because of its interactive nature. As Clausewitz said, war is a continuous interaction of opposites and your enemy has a say in the future course of events. I mean, think about how we've waged these wars lately, right? We announce years in advance exactly the number of troops we're gonna have there, what they're gonna do, what they're not gonna do. I mean, I think if the great captains of history were to come back and look at how we fought wars in, in, in Afghanistan and Iraq, they'd think we're crazy. And then, and then finally, war is a contest of wills. And I think this is an import, important message for our leaders in particular, who have not done a good job of explaining to the American people the two, the two things that they really need to know, right? What, what is at stake? What is at stake in this war? And, and secondly, what is a strategy that will deliver a favorable outcome at a cost that's acceptable to the American people? So this is a very important book. It's very timely, Tom uh, and Eric, because I, I think we are in danger of neglecting the, 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 the hard won lessons of our most recent wars and going back to our definition of future war as we would like it to be. And we have in many ways resurrected the vampire. And, and, and I think we're seeing uh, th these sort of fallacies about future war in a new guise. So thanks Tom for, for putting this all, all together. And thanks Eric for, for being with us to, to help, uh, help people understand the, the importance of this book. Well, thank you both for that terrific set of introductory remarks. Um, what, what I thought I would do is, um, I, mean, I could go on all day with uh, questions for the two of you, uh, but we do have limited time. So first I want to, for uh, the uh, 160 some odd um, participants we have, I would invite you, if you've got a question, to put it in the Q&A box and in about 15 minutes, I will turn to those uh, questions and, and begin curating them for Tom and HR to, to answer. But let me just pose uh, three initial questions to the, to you, the two of you, um, and, uh, and then we'll turn to the audience questions. So one is a methodological question, and then two are questions about lessons that one might draw from, from the book uh, for contemporary purposes. Um, and HR, I invite you to, I mean, in some sense, they're a bridge to your book. I mean, I note that your book starts with the Thucydidean triptych of, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, fear, honor, and interest. Um, so please feel free to flog your book, you know, as, as, as well uh, as we do this, because the two really are related in a lot of ways. So, and, and, another, and another great holiday gift, I, I would point out. As well. Yes, exactly. So um, it is the giving season. So um, Start, let me start with the methodological question. So on this panel, we've got uh, two um, folks with PhDs in history who went on to be practitioners in diplomacy and, and, uh, and the military arts, respectively, and a social scientist with a very historical bent. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that HR had the same lessons beaten into him in graduate school at, at UNC that I did at Yale, which is that as a historian, you are never, 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 never supposed to allow your reconstruction of events in the past to be tainted by, you know, the concerns of, you know, of the uh, present. 
And, and to be sure, uh, presentism can seriously distort uh, one's reconstruction of, of past events. Um, I mean, I would argue it's also impossible to reconstruct past events without having some sense of, you know, where you ended up because, you know, uh, otherwise any path can get you there. But um, I, I'd be interested in the two of you first come, you know, talking about the tension uh, between, you know, the two. The second question that I have um, goes very explicitly to Afghanistan and HR, you adverted to it in your remarks. The three chapters in this book by uh, Carter Malkisian, Todd Greentree, and Theo Farrell tell a pretty sorry story about the combined US-UK uh, experience in Afghanistan. Um, clearly, the Trump administration, as it's going out the door, is making uh, some adjustments. I mean, I have my own views about how uh, well considered those adjustments are. Um, but what, what would the two of you say was the big takeaway from the retrospective study of, of how we waged, and I would say it was more than one war uh, really in Afghanistan. We really fought several different wars in Afghanistan at various points in time. Um, but uh, what is the takeaway from this for the you know, current debate about what our posture should be uh, going forward in Afghanistan? And, and I uh, want to you know, ask the question advisedly because uh, you should be aware that Carter is in the audience. Um, and then the third uh, question is, uh, HR, you uh, were instrumental in um, doing something that uh, very few other of your predecessors as national security advisor um, can claim credit for having done, which is having completed a national security strategy in the first year of a presidential administration. It was a, a huge accomplishment, uh, and I think the nation owes you a great debt for it. Um, but the national security strategy that you husbanded and got President Trump to announce in December of 2017 was very much focused on a different set of uh, potential conflicts than the ones that by and large are, are studied um, in uh, learning the lessons of modern war. They are great power conflicts with near peers like uh, the uh, People's Republic of China and Russia. And of course you address those in, in your book, but Surely there should be things from the study of uh, the wars that are covered in, in uh, the book Tom edited and great power competition. I'd like the two of you to maybe tease out some, some of those lessons. And so I'll let both of you take a whack at those three questions and then we'll go to the audience if, if that's okay. Sure, why, why, don't I, uh, why don't I lead off and then uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be interested in, in HR's uh, view. Like to the to the first, um, you know, to the first your first question. I think it's a great one because whether you're talking historians or um, you know political scientists, kind of each each tribe has its own pathologies. Um, and uh, since I'm neither for the uh, well, no, actually I'm a historian, but my PhD is in international affairs. Uh, uh, I can I can kind of you know look step step back uh, you know step back and look at both tribes, right? So you, you have the pathology of uh, of the historian that just just doesn't want to you know. Uh, uh, claim claim any sort of relevance, uh, and then you have the political scientists that you know just you just just rub two facts together, and you you have a, a theory or maybe even a religion. Uh, I guess my my view of uh, theory actually comes from Clausewitz, right? Uh, which is that um, the way you you know theory is there to guide uh, the mind, not uh, and you get theory by under by deep study of understanding of the facts. It emerges out of deep, you know, deep study of conflict from all different perspectives. And um, I think that's, to my mind, that's, that's the, best, the best use of theory. So I think whether it's theoretically minded historians or historically minded political scientists, there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of common ground there. You know, on, on Afghanistan, um, I think w one of the things that that strikes me, you know, from from the chapters, but even beyond that, is just look. I'll, I'll go back to Clausewitz. Uh, you know, he he wrote, you know, the the first uh, supreme quest, you know, uh, task is to understand the nature of the war uh, upon which one is embarked, neither mistaking it for nor trying to turn it into something that's alien to its nature. I think there there have been very deep disagreements over the nature of that war um, the, and, and thus 
you know, the theory of victory uh, in, in Afghanistan. And I think that, I think that comes out very, very clearly from the, from the chapters. Um, and just very briefly on, on, cause I really want to hear HR's uh, answer, but very briefly, I mean, I think, you know, we see in the, even in the, in the chapters here, um, the role of, uh, you know, of, of outside powers, including, you know, Russia in a number of cases, um, that, that they've played in even these, these, you know, smaller wars. And I think if you, again, you expand it to, to Syria, you, you know, you look at, uh, uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan. I don't. I don't think we should limit our understanding of great power competition and great power conflict to a direct war between the United States and Russia, the United States and China. Um, we're likely to see Chinese, Russian involvement, uh, all, all sorts of uh, places and all sorts of ways going forward. Hey, hey thanks, Tom. Hey, on, on, on method, I, I would just say that I think what history helps you do is, is, is ask the right questions. In fact, I start the, I start the forward for, for the book here with, uh, with you know, a, a, a memory of Don Higginbotham, who was one of my advisors at the University of North Carolina, Chapel, Chapel Hill, great, the great historian, you know, and I finished my written exams and he said, hey, HR, congratulations, you now know more history than you will ever know. And so what's not, what's important about history is, as, as Thomas said, I think is not to give you the answer, but to help you ask the right questions. And, and I think your, your, your comment about Clausewitz and theory is dead on. He says, you know, it's like the role of a professor. You know, once you leave your studies with a professor, he doesn't accompany you to, in life and help you make your life decisions, but that professor has equipped you, right, to, to help make better life decisions. And, and I think that's what the study of history Helps, helps us do. I, I do believe that history, and I may touch on this, I think, in the, in the forward as well, is that it is an exercise in humility, right? And what's, what's dangerous, I think, in foreign policy, and especially in war, is any degree of arrogance or belief that you have sole or preponderant agency over the future. Because what you understand from history is the complex causality of events, right? And as Sir Michael Howard says when he, when he tells us to study history and with depth and context, you know, when you study history in depth, the tidy outlines, you know, sort of, sort of disintegrate and you recognize the role of contingency and chance and so forth. So I think, I think that the, the, uh, the method uh, is, is, is solid to try to learn from history because, because the, the historian's humility, I think, allows you to confront contemporary problems on their own terms, but also to do so in a way that's informed by previous human experience. I also think to say you don't need to think about history or learn history is profoundly arrogant. Because you know what you're saying is, hey, all I need to know is my lived experience. That's all I need. I can make the best decisions without the benefit of, of, of human experience that predated me. So, uh, so that's what, one of the, these are the reasons why I'm a big fan of this book and, and, and the study of history uh, and, 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 and an attempt to understand how the past produced the present as the first step in, in making a projection in, into the future. On Afghanistan, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, Eric. I don't. I don't think we could have screwed it up worse if we deliberately set up to screw it up in in, in South Asia and Afghanistan. And 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 the reason for this is that we neglected history and we took a short term approach to what was a long term problem. And so initially, we we hoped to take kind of the George Costanza approach to war and just leave on a high note. So we didn't plan to remain engaged in a meaningful way to help shape that political outcome and help this traumatized society become Afghanistan again. But then after the neglect of Afghanistan, the shift of the focus toward Iraq, the, the growth of the Taliban strength, the regeneration of it with the help of Al Qaeda and the Pakistan Inter Services Intelligence of, their, of the Pakistani army, you know, th then we realized, well, gosh, we have a big problem in, in, in Afghanistan again. And, and of course, when the, when the, by the time the, the, the George W. Bush administration refocused on Afghanistan, it was about time to transition to the Obama administration. And it was in this period of time when we said, okay, well, let's do some you know, nation building now. And so we, 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 we uh, expended so, much, so many resources in Afghanistan that were beyond the absorptive capacity of, of the country. And we, we didn't do it in a smart way. You know, we were enthusiastic now uh, about it, but we, we didn't do it in, in, in a smart way. And then, uh, and then a whole series of, of unrealistic assumptions underpinned our efforts. Uh, and then in the Obama years, you know, we conjured up the enemy we would like, you know, we listen to people who said, oh, the, you know, the Taliban, you know, power sharing with them is a, 
a good idea. Okay, what does that look like? Is that mass executions in the stadium like every other Saturday? Is that every other girls' school bulldozed? You know, we conjured up the enemy we prefer, you know, an enemy that has a bold line between it and, and, and uh, jihadist terrorist organizations. And what was particularly striking about our, our strategic incompetence in Afghanistan is the degree to which what we were trying to achieve politically and diplomatically was utterly disconnected from, our, from what we're doing militarily and also disconnected uh, from what we're doing from an informational perspective and a diplomatic perspective. And uh, we tried to align that when I was National Security Advisor. We tried to give the president options that would put, I, I think, for the first time, put into place a reasoned and sustainable approach to the problem set in Afghanistan and South Asia broadly. And I think he did it. But then, of, of course, backed off from it prematurely and in many ways doubled down on the same flawed assumptions and flawed approach of, of the Obama administration. I, I, I mean, I tell this whole kind of wretched story in, in my book, but I just, I mean, I think we're on a path to, to, to disaster there that is going to create a humanitarian catastrophe of colossal scale, and it's going to compel us to, to go back. You know, I, I mean, we had 8,500 troops there, a very small number. The, 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 um, the amount of resources we're spending is also very small. I think we talked ourselves into defeat in Afghanistan because we set an unrealistic standard, okay? Afghanistan's not going to be Denmark, right? But it doesn't need to be Denmark. In fact, the number of troops that we had there were far below the number of the coalition troops, you know, uh, the, uh, less the Afghans, and the Afghans were bearing the brunt of the fight, right? So um, anyway, I'm very concerned about it. I, you know, I read about this more extensively, but I, I think that we, you know, we've defeated ourselves there, but not, I mean, but not without cause. And, you know, I'm very, I'm sympathetic, you know, to the, end, the endless wars narrative, because as I mentioned, we, you know, leaders have not talked to the American people about what's at stake. Uh, and and uh, and what is a sustainable strategy that gets us to an acceptable outcome? And then and then um, and then I think there are really parallels between the lessons from these wars and and competitions uh, with, with 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 China and, and Russia and, and Iran and North Korea and, and others as well. And, and I think what what comes out of these essays is the need for us to understand these challenges on their own terms, and in particular to to have a degree of what our, our historian. Uh, whose work I admire tremendously, Zachary Shore calls strategic empathy, right? And that is, that, that is paying particular attention to what drives and constrains the other, of course, interest, but especially emotions and ideology. And I think oftentimes we neglect that. And, and so I would say that the other lesson then is related to my observation on Afghanistan is the importance of integrating all elements of national power, right? Diplomatic efforts, military efforts, uh, economic efforts, informational, law enforcement, financial actions, and so forth, and efforts of like-minded partners, uh, and, and, and to do so in a way that's synergistic and, and allows you to maintain the initiative. Uh, so, so, you know, thanks for the great questions, and, and uh, I look forward to where, where, you know, where our attendees want to take the uh, conversation. Well, HR and Tom, thank you. We've got uh, some 14 questions here in the queue. And um, I want to apologize in advance to uh, our uh, audience participants. I don't think in the next 20 minutes we're going to be able to get to, to all of them, but I'm, I'm going to try and just systematically work through, uh, through the questions that have been submitted. So first, um, what lessons, if any, do you think uh, can be gleaned from the recent uh, conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, between Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan? Tom, you've made reference to this in your opening remarks, but uh, early, early lessons learned, uh, you know, without the benefit of um, sponsorship by TRADOC uh, to do a deep study. Well, and it, look, it, it is a conflict worthy of, worthy of deep study, right? Because I think what we're seeing unfolding, and you know, I said, either we're, we're at war or we're in a, an interwar period, we are in an interwar period, you know, as um, and I hope it's a very long interwar period. Let me just put it that way. But um, what we're seeing tried out are new ways of war and including, you know, uh, uh, in, this, in this conflict. I think one of, the, I'll just say one thing uh, that it strikes me is it's, it's further evidence for just how far uh, precision strike capabilities have, have spread. And I don't mean that in a, you know, end of history, uh, you know, total transformation of warfare, but look, you know, the, the, the widespread routine use of a precision strike 
um, by, let's just say, not cutting edge militaries. And I think that should give us pause because the, the counterpart to that is uh, a highly lethal battlefield. And I think we, uh, we, need, we need to take that uh, uh, to heart uh, as, as we move forward with you know, our doctrine development and, and our modernization. But I'd, I'd be interested in, uh, in HR's thoughts. Well, Tom, I'll just offer a thought that, that would reinforce what you, what you said, which I think it really shows the importance of integrating combined arms and joint capabilities. You know, we made a series of assumptions in the 90s that we would, we would achieve, you know, dominance, you know, especially in the aerospace domain, for, for example. And we divested ourselves of a lot of really important capabilities, some uh, terrestrial-based uh, uh, electronic warfare capabilities, layered air defense capabilities. And, and so what we are seeing now is how the, the adoption of some of what we thought were, were our, you know, exclusive advantages, ours being, you know, Western NATO-based you know, militaries, uh, and also the development of countermeasures to what our adversaries saw as our differential advantages. And so we need to adapt. We need to adapt much more quickly. And I think we, can, we have to avoid a simple solution to the problem of future war, one that's based on the war as we would like it to be. Because as we, as we see in Nagorno-Karabakh, that these technologies uh, really are, are, are transferable quite easily uh, to other militaries. And, um, and I think the other, the other, the other lesson is, is, a, is a geostrategic one. Um, and it's really about the, you know, the, 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 this uh, relationship between Russia and, and Turkey. And, and uh, you know, Eric would be the best person probably to, to talk about this. But, uh, but we have now Turkey, who has been fighting through proxies, Russian-supported forces in the Goro Karnabakh, in the northern Idlib province of Syria, and in Libya. And so... Is this an opportunity, uh, uh, part of an opportunity to help convince the AKP, uh, this, is, this is Erdogan's party, you're probably not going to convince Erdogan, uh, but, but other Turkish leaders that, hey, they, they've really made a big mistake uh, in enabling Russia th across the Middle East, and, and they've made a big mistake in their drift away from the West, and that's where their future really is, and, and maybe, maybe there's, a, there's, a, there's a kernel of hope there for the restoration of, of more of a Kamalist approach, you know, to to, uh, to foreign policy in the West. I, I, I can't help but take the, you know, uh, privilege of the chair because uh, HR invited me to say, um, I agree with him about the geopolitical side of this. And I also agree that Erdogan won't be persuaded of this at all, but the others might. Uh, but the other lesson I think that is important for us to see here is the unintended consequences of arms control. Uh, the reason that Turkey developed its own uh, indigenous uh, UAV um, capability uh, was in part because we refused to sell it an armed UAV capability. Um, and uh, we've lost the ability now to influence them through that kind of arms sales relationship. Uh, and they themselves are going to go forward, uh, you know, I think uh, pretty clearly to proliferate this capability, not just to Azerbaijan, but elsewhere. And as HR pointed out, it's been a capability that's shown itself to be quite capable on the battlefield wasn't wasn't altogether surprising that Turkey, which has a fairly uh, good aviation industry, would be able to solve the technical problems. But what's really impressive is that they've developed the uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures to deploy this uh, this stuff to the battlefield in in Libya, in Idlib, and now in uh, Azerbaijan as effectively as they have in such a short period of time. Um, our next question uh, is one that I really love. Um, the, the military tends to use Clausewitz as their touchstone in the study of the war, but civilian academics tend to use Schelling, among others. Who is better for understanding the future, Clausewitz or Schelling? Or do we need a new theorist to better capture the nature of war today and in the, in the near future? Uh, yeah, and I'll just, uh, since, since I can see it, yeah, thanks, thanks Carter Malkazian for a really good, uh, uh, <laughs> not, not just a great chapter in the book, but, but asking a really good question, so. Um, rec uh, understood. Uh, look, my, look. First, uh, um, I would say that it's it's not just important to understand history deeply. I think it's also important to to understand strategic theory deeply. And uh, um, at the risk of sounding sacrilegious, I think oftentimes I think of uh, 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 on war like the Bible, in that there are more people that are willing to quote it than actually read it, and more people who are actually well, more people who read it than actually understand it. Um, 
I think, and, and I, I have, uh, I, I have the greatest respect for the late Tom Schelling as well. I mean, I think say, I would say the same thing about Schelling's work that, um, more, 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 uh, policymakers, more academics will quote Schelling than, than I think really take the time to pick apart his, his works, which are actually quite, I think quite profound. Uh, but, but, but Carter, since you put it that way, um, uh, uh, look, I think that they both deserve to be in the uh, top five, uh, you know, kind of great strategic theorists. I'll, I'll give, I'll give Clausewitz the, uh, the nose. Uh, um, I'll give him the lead just because uh, he's been around longer, uh, translated <laughs> and, uh, and, and used and abused uh, more times. That having been said, I, I think the, the, the great value of strategic theory to, to HR's point is, is it helps us understand the, the continuities. It's not that the discontinuities don't exist and not that the discontinuities can't be actually very profound, but a, a, an understanding, a deep understanding of the continuities then frees us up to take our limited resources and focus on the, on the new and the different. Without an understanding of the continuities, then everything's new. <laughs> and we just kind of go, you know, uh, maybe slightly kinder than, than the way uh, uh, HR uh, phrased it. We're just kind of, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like Groundhog Day. We're just learning these things that we probably don't need to learn. So um, I think there is room for new theory. Um, I think there are, there's room for improvement. But let's, let's, let's build on the very substantial base that already exists. And, and I, you know, I'm very partial to Clausewitz. Also, I've got my, I've got my, my dog-eared and Mark, you know, Mark Gopier that I go back to from from time to time. And and I think what what really is important to know about Clausewitz is that he had a lot of combat experience. You know, I think he was 15 or something when he first was it was in battle. And so he had this combination of, of thinking deeply and clearly. I think about war and and warfare but also understanding the human, the human, the psychological, the emotional dimension of, of battle and, and of combat. And, and you remember he was writing at a time when there were these theorists, uh, uh, theorists who were saying, well, you know, it's really not the battle that's that important. You know, he's, he's like, well, yeah, of course it is. You know, and, and so I, I think it's that, it's that practical aspect as, as well as, you know, the theoretical brilliance of the book that, that sets it, that sets it apart. And then, uh, and then with, with, with Schelling, I think it's, it's a different kind of body of, of scholarship. Uh, and, and in particular, I think what, Schelling's, uh, what, Sch what Schelling has written that is most enduring is his description of deterrence by denial. And, and especially the importance of convincing your, your, your adversary that, that, that your adversary cannot accomplish his objectives through the use of, of force or these days through the range of kind of new generation warfare capabilities that might accomplish objectives below the level a threshold that, that might elicit a, a military response. And I think this is particularly relevant to how aggressive China has, is, is becoming uh, across the Indo-Pacific region, especially vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. I think sometimes we go for what seems easiest, like, hey, we have this great, you know, global strike capability and who's going to mess with us because, you know, because we can pose them with the threat of punitive action after the fact. Well, I think the historical record suggests that, hey, you know, deterrence by the threat of punitive action is, is inferior to the, to, the, to the ability to deter by denial. And I, and I think Schelling can help us maybe maintain our will to have forward positioned capable joint forces as an important part of that deterrent capability. You know, our forces that are deployed abroad are, are at historic lows. I mean, I think lowest ever since, since the end of World War II, you know, and or be, since before World War II. And so I think it's it's important for us to sustain that capability uh, because it is that physical presence forward that is immensely important for deterrence. And, and it is that physical presence forward that turns so-called denied space by the very nature of having forces forward into contested space right from the outset. And I don't hear many people making that argument these days. There is this really, I think, momentum behind withdrawing forces from abroad as an unmitigated good. And we've seen that with you know, this announcement of the withdrawal from Europe, but also there's been this has been applied to to uh, to, to the Indo-Pacific region as well. I mean, it, I think that I think the the withdrawal of U.S. forces, for example, uh, from the Philippines was a you know, was a necessary condition uh, for what China's done in the South China Sea, for example. I, I'm going to uh, combine a couple of questions into one, uh, and then uh, after um, giving uh, you and um, HR, Tom, a chance to answer them. 
um, you know, turn to you to um, make your summary comments because unfortunately we're running out of time. As I said, I think we could probably go on all day uh, with this. But uh, several questions have uh, focused HR on your uh, comment about uh, artificial intelligence um, and uh, the, you know, um, as a modern day uh, example of strategic, um, you know, bombing uh, theory that, you know, essentially AI will be determinative of the outcome of war. Um, there are questions, I think, that are asking you to clarify what your view is about uh, how much it will actually change the character of war and not just AI, but other uh, uh, kinds of asymmetric capabilities that are uh, developing cyber space, robotics, how do they fit into your fallacies and to, to the lessons that Tom has, uh, uh, has uh, attempted to draw in the book with his colleagues. Uh, and um, in particular, if you could address the question of, of uh, uh, war as or organized violence. Um, uh, someone noted that you did not mention uh, when you were talking about uh, you know, the nature of war that it is by nature uh, violent. Uh, and wanted to know whether you meant that deliberately or uh, in the sense of uh, new generation warfare and, and um, you know, operations below the kinetic level being potentially decisive. Tom, do you want to go first on these or? Okay, so hey, I'll, just, I'll just say that, uh, you know, obviously I, I think that we have to maintain our, our competitive advantage in the area of the artificial intelligence range of technologies. Uh, there's a great commission that, uh, that Ili Bajraktari is running, a National Commission on Artificial Intelligence. They're doing great work. I fully endorse you know, their recommendations to maintain our competitive advantage. But where, where I think that we, we set ourselves up for problems is when we believe that future war as a result of artificial intelligence will be knowledge centric or decision centric. And and again, this resurrects the fundamental assumption that underpinned the orthodoxy of the RMA. And that, that is the assumption that these technological advances will shift war fundamentally from the realm of uncertainty into the realm of certainty. And if anybody's super bored over the holidays, they can read a monograph I wrote about this uh, in the early 2000s called Crack in the Foundation, Defense Transformation and the Underlying Assumption of Dominant Knowledge in, in, in Future War. And the, re the reason why this is, this is wrongheaded goes back to to a historian of technology, L.T. Morrison, who wrote a great book in the 1960s called Men, Machines, and Modern Times. And, and in this book, he, he writes that, that man, of course, you know, he's writing in the 60s, men and women have, have, um, have spent a great deal of effort in, in developing technologies to tame uh, our natural environment, but in so doing have created an artificial environment that's even more complex than our natural environment ever was. And it's that complexity that maintains uncertainty. And it's also the fact that I don't care what database you access for, you know, for artificial intelligence, there's going to, there'll be data in that database that's bad, that's contradictory, that preserves un uncertainty. So I, what's dangerous about it, what's pernicious about it is if you say, okay, war is going to be fundamentally in the realm of certainty, then what you believe is, hey, what's most important is developing the perfect plan because you got perfect knowledge. So planning is more important than, than, than execution. And if you believe that planning, it, 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 the plan is perfect, well, you're gonna ensure implementation of that, right? So you're gonna centralize command and control. You're not gonna decentralize command and control. I mean, you're gonna emphasize adherence to the plan and synchronization, overtaking of initiative. Organizationally, you're gonna centralize assets, right? At higher levels. Because you, at the, at, at, as the French called it before World War II, as the commander at the handle of the fan, you'll know everything and you'll be able to direct everything centrally. So I, I think it's very dangerous. And, and so war is not knowledge centric, war is fighting centric. And you need knowledge to enable you. You need to make decisions faster and better than your adversary. But those decisions will be made in an environment that is fundamentally uncertain, no matter how much artificial intelligence related technologies you have ava available to you. I, that's what I, I believe anyway. And then of course, war is organized violence. I think that's still the right definition. Uh, I think that there, there's violence, the threat of violence associated with Russian new generation warfare as well. I don't know what we call it. You know, there, we have so many names for it, you know, gray zone conflict and so forth. But, you know, I, I, think, <laughs> I think our understanding of it, you know, whether, whatever the heck you call it, uh, is getting better. 
And I think we're, we're becoming more adept at competing below the threshold that might elicit a military response. Of course, what's dangerous, you know, about Russian new generation warfare or, or walking up to the edge this way is that it's, it's easy to go off the edge quite rapidly. And so it's important for us to back up what we're doing from countering this pernicious form of Russian subversion uh, with, with a strong conventional uh, and sadly nuclear deterrent as well. Yeah, I'll, 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 uh, I'll actually take this since, since we're wrapping up. Let me just, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up by way of uh, uh, basically agreeing with HR and just, and just putting it into the context of, of you know, the book, which is, like, the, these, these are uh, very important questions. And I think they, they're, they're questions that the U.S. military, U.S. policymakers, policymakers, militaries across the world are going to be grappling with. Right, just just how transformational, if at all, are these new technologies? How, if at all, have the have the borders uh, of of war shifted? Um, I, I agree. So so a HR has his uh, vampire fallacy. I have my silver bullet fallacy, which is every couple generations there's a new silver bullet that's going to free us from the confines of strategy, whether it's strategic bombing, uh, nuclear weapons cyber, now AI. Um, and at least all, all the time in the past, that's, that's been misguided, that, that there's, no, there's no free ticket. There's no uh, bypassing strategy, interaction, violence. And, and as to the violent nature of war, again, I agree. I, I think non there, there strategy exists in peacetime uh, all the way through war. And I think uh, HR is right, we, we face competitors in Russia and China that, that don't admit a, a dichotomy between peace and war, kind of that comforting dichotomy that we in the United States, we in the West cling to, um, they see much more kind of a, a gradations. And that's, that's, that's a challenge. And I think it's a challenge in part in this bring shelling back into it. Um, there's likely to be misperception. There's likely to be miscalculation. So to, to kind of, you know, take it, take it back to where we started. I mean, I think, look, these are, these are profoundly important questions uh, for the United States, for, uh, for our allies and, and our friends. Um, and, you know, we, we need to be generating the best possible thought uh, to try to get a, get a grasp on, on those questions. And so if this, you know, if this book is, a, is an offering or an initial down payment on that, then it will have, uh, it will have served its purpose. And um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been my pleasure to, to take part in this whole, uh, uh, whole project. Not that it hasn't been with, uh, it had its frustrations, it's had its frustrations, but we got, but we got it over the finish line. And, uh, and it really is a great, a great book. And I can say that because it was my pleasure to edit it. Uh, other, others did the, did the, uh, the heavy lifting. So, uh, I, I, I personally wanted to thank uh, uh, HR and, and Eric for, for joining us for this, uh, for this launch. Um, Eric, uh, back, back to you and back to HR. HR, I'm going to give you the very last word, uh, but it's going to have to be fit into about 60 seconds. <laughs> okay. Hey, Tom and Eric, pleasure to be with you. Hey, Tom, you did a brilliant job with it. So did all the contributors. I just want to say thanks to all the contributors. The essays are superb, you know, and, and, uh, I learned a lot from the from the project, and it was a privilege to, to 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 work on it with you. And thanks for engaging in protracted war to get it finally published, Tom. <laughs> thanks, thanks everybody. <laughs>